Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Right. Another day, <laughs> another new watch. Oh God, before you start typing in, I thought you were quitting collecting. I have sold off uh, three or four pieces, possibly another one later today. You'll see in a moment why. However, I have been searching for this particular piece for almost six months, patiently hunting eBay. So let's roll the intro and get into it. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I'll start off with a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing my, I was about to say, <laughs> I'm about to say Panerai. I have Panerai on the brain. My Panerai is in for servicing, so I'm wearing my Tudor Submariner on the original oyster bracelet there. Absolutely loving it. I miss my Panerai so much so. Last night I caught myself on eBay looking at another Panerai. I almost had to slap myself. Uh, <laughs> what am I doing? I miss my Panerai that much, who would have ever thought it? Yeah, it's in for service at Moya. Shout out to Derek at Moya Fine Jewelers. Thank you to them. It's actually not that expensive. I already got an estimate back. The great thing is the Valjou, very easy to service. Come to think of it, they service the ETA in this as well. So what can I say? I specified I don't want anything polished or anything like that. So it's just the movement, pressure testing, regulation. Uh, it was running a little bit too slow for my liking. Anyway, we're not talking about Panerai. What is wrong with me? Right, a little bit of context. Let's get into it. I've discussed in detail in various videos how most of the Swiss watchmaking industry cleverly pivoted towards producing aspirational and luxury items over the essentially high-end tool watchmaking of before in order to survive the onslaught of vastly more affordable and deadly accurate quartz crisis causing technology from Japan during the 1970s. Rolex being undoubtedly the vanguard and most successful with its Glengarry Glen Ross status signaling or just keeping up with the newly moneyed Joneses style marketing. It was crucial not only to make a profit, but to justify the higher costs involved in producing traditional mechanical watchmaking over the literal cheapest circuit chips cost of quartz. But more importantly, it needed to make the now obsolete technology more desirable than quartz. Fast forward to the present day, and there are even waiting lists for some mechanical watches, and worse, the nauseating boiler room grey market investment culture that has sadly flourished on social media, like some kind of cancerous parasite leeching on the industry. AP's Royal Oak was successful because it did something daring and different design-wise that today we all very much take for granted. But back then, the idea of an all-steel, super high-end Hort Horology sports watch seemed as utterly insane as Blackadder's last-ditch effort to avoid further fighting in the war. I'm just off to Hartlepool to buy some exploding trousers. <laughs> Again, sir. Have you gone barking mad? Yes, George, I have. Cluck, cluck, jibber, jibber, my old man's a mushroom, etc. <laughs> the watchmaking industry in Switzerland was pretty much going to die. Quartz watches were much cheaper, much more accurate. Mechanical watch became obsolete. By their own admission, by those who worked at AP at the time, it was a risky and bold last roll of the dice. Since the first Royal Oaks introduction in 1972, the brand and industry would never be the same again. Patek, by that time, also had their backs against the wall and needed something similar to rejuvenate their rather stuffy old world image. So they headhunted Gerald Genta, the Swiss-Italian designer of the Royal Oak, to come and sprinkle some of that badly needed trademark style of his that mix of brutalist, retro sci-fi, modernist magic on the Patek brand. And as we all know, launched in 1976, the very first Patek Nautilus was introduced. But that alone wasn't enough to save Patek. They also badly needed some competitive new technology. 
So before working for AP and uh, Patek, Genta had already established himself as a top designer in the industry, barely in his 20s, which is just astonishing to think. I think back to what I was doing in my, <laughs> my 20s. I boring I was. Anyway, what did he do? In the mid 60s, there was the White Shadow. Uh, in the late 50s, there was a pole router for Universal de Genève, which I've already talked about and I used to own at one time. Oh, and in 59, there was that revamp of the Amiga Constellation as well. In 1968, Patek introduced the Golden Ellipse, a unisex contemporary but still quintessentially classic dress watch. Many, including Wikipedia, erroneously credit Genta for the design, but it is generally recognised that Jean-Daniel Rubelli, Patek's in-house stylist and head of research and development at the time, was actually responsible. This was then confirmed by Genta himself in a 2009 interview. Inspired by Fibonacci's golden ratio, a pattern that we see repeated in nature and in perfect design almost everywhere, it ultimately dictated the idiosyncratic shape. First conceived in 1966, Rubelli stated that had Mr. Genta not existed, he would never have conceived of the idea for the creation of the ellipse. While it is certainly an acquired taste, it's the choice of the music artist Drake, actor and current king of sprezzatura Keanu Reeves, Sergio Mattarella, the president of Italy, Queen Elizabeth II, and if you recall my video on Bond watch villains, Ernst Stavro Blofeld in the 007 movie On a Majesty's Secret Service. To ensure it was a hit, Patek decided to advertise it in quite a daring way. Well, by today's overly PC standards, that is. Advertising is based on one thing, happiness. And you know what happiness is? Happiness is the smell of a new car. They hired the original NYC madman, Seth Tobias, who came up with a brilliantly creative and rather risky advertising campaign. It played humorously in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way, with ideas of elitism, money and class. So is it any wonder that the character Niles Crane wore it in Frasier, one of my favourite TV shows of all time? So why am I telling you about the Patek Ellipse? What has this overlooked dress watch got to do with making Patek the powerhouse that it is today? Especially when we see watches like the Nautilus get all the pop culture attention. So she like how I move when I put her on the jet, cut the rolly for a starter, then I put her in Patek. Well, the secret ingredient is not actually in a Patek. It's actually found inside the watch that inspired the ellipse in the first place. Hey, hey. Quick knife check uh, using the case there, the old, I want to say flintlock, but <laughs> it's not a rifle. It's the uh, rust lock there. So uh, yeah, let's, let's get into this. <laughs> Oh, I can see it, I can see it. Oh. Make an incision there and pull it out. I think that, that will be the strategy. There's no box, uh, so we'll do a drum roll here. Oh, there it is. Oh my God, yes. Look at that. So you see, this is an early one with the Romans that Genta did first with the stepped case. Then he did this more kind of uh, ellipse case and then the integrated bracelet. So he was doing integrated bracelets on this before the AP and the, the Nautilus. So that's pretty cool, even though I think this is a later model. But yeah, as, as part of my policy, I'm gonna have to choose between them. There is several different types. There's the C type case, which is very much continuation of Genta's work. Uh, like you can see it in the um, Mega Constellation he did in the late 50s. Hold on, Whoa, let's zoom in. Yeah, I think Patek also took inspiration from their blue from this as well. Yeah, one has to stay, one has to go, although this does have that beautiful strap. So I'm pleased to report it's keeping really great time. Uh, it's absolutely perfect for me. Kind of reminiscent of a white gold Patek, which I really, really love. This is the original. I'm, yeah, my mind's confused. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there's something else about this timepiece that we should discuss. So let's take a look. Well, since acquiring the Roman numeral white dial version at the start of this year with that more stepped oval case, I became obsessed with learning as much as I could about it. 
After a little more digging around online, I came across a rather startling discovery. Aside from it being one of the thinnest automatic movements in the world at the time, especially when it was first produced in 1965 until a new record was broken by another brand in 1978, possibly AP or Piaget, I'm still actually not sure who won that race, but maybe somebody in the audience will know. The watch actually held another interesting characteristic that would be key to changing Patek forever. I may have mentioned before, I mainly watch the Italian watch channels when it comes to horology on YouTube. They do an amazing job of being less about the vomit-inducing investment talk or the puerile drama, and actually more about the watches and horology in general. In fact, I did my first video entirely in Italian for Davide Cecchini's channel last month. So for my Italian speaking audience, do check it out if you missed it. Another channel I enjoy immensely is Pasquale at PSQ Watches. He did a great video about his white shadow. He was kind enough to recommend a specialist Italian forum called Orologi e Passioni for a deep dive on the Universal Genève's caliber 2-66. So it turns out that aside from a myriad of legal problems, its creator was an engineer called Gerard Beret, who is most well known for eventually going on to become the technical director at Patek Philippe. He oversaw the development of the 3940, which is Patek's first ultra-thin automatic perpetual calendar. The perpetual calendar is perhaps the most emblematic of complications chez Patek. The reference 3940 again was historically important in that it was, if you like, an amuse bouche for the horological banquet that would follow. But crucially, he gained all his experience by working at Universal Genève first, leaving the brand in 1968 to take up his position at Patek. The very first project he developed at his new digs was the legendary micro rotor based Calibre 240 movement that helped Patek stay alive through the quartz crisis and able to finally compete with AP's ultra-thin Calibre 2120 that was in the new Royal Oak. Variations of the 240 remain the backbone of most of Patek today. In fact, if you look at it side by side with the White Shadows 2-66, extra refinement and decoration aside, the similarity in architecture is undeniable. In an ironic twist of fate, the 240 would then find its way into the uh, ellipse in, I think, 1978, and then, of course, the Calatrava, the Nautilus to this very day. But beyond that, it was also the basis of a lot more complicated movements. Uh, it was modified and uh, at world time as grand complications were then added. And to think it all started here with this humble, little, affordable, dress watch. This legacy is all manifested and encapsulated in this. You can begin to see why I'm so obsessed with the white shadow and the story behind this. As Gérald Janta said himself, it was like a magical moment of pure creation. Something that just happens once. Technology is a glittering lure, but uh, there's the rare occasion when the public can be engaged on a level beyond flash. The quest for ever thinner watches has always been an expression of watchmaking prowess, and still to this day. The White Shadow combines this technical innovation with many of the other aspects that I enjoy and love about watches, such as influential design, heritage, meaning, style, and so on. But best of all, without any of the hype or ridiculous price tag, I feel like it's something only true watch enthusiasts really know about. The meaning of the name White Shadow itself has ancient spiritual connotations. The seen, unseen, so to speak, and it's perfect if you think about it. It only reinforces Genta's design genius. Before helping to save AP and Patek from the quartz crisis and making them the giants they are today, he made the White Shadow. And while the Patek Ellipse will always be my favourite Patek, the less flashy classical side of Patek that is, where less is so much more, and even more difficult to master design-wise, to me, it all started with the White Shadow first. Now, knowing this largely untold story of its mechanics as well as its design, it only makes the watch even cooler, aside from being possibly the most comfortable watch I've ever owned. Now, you tell me that isn't gorgeous. Che meraviglia, ragazzi, che meraviglia. There's still quite a few out there. You just have to be patient. Have a look on eBay. It's got me thinking. 
is the integrated bracelet trend on dress watches next? We've seen it come back with a vengeance with sporty watches, but not with dress watches. This is amazing, I have to say. The instant adjustability, you can get the precise fit, the fluidity of it. It's wonderful. And I don't know if you can hear that. Micro rotors have a very different sound. They go zzz, zzz. It's not the same as, well, that's, that's old jingly jangly there. Am I gonna sell the Roman numeral one? I, I'm gonna think about it. I don't know because they're so different, but at the same time, I've gotta be strict. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, what do you think of dress watches like this? What do you think the next hot trend is gonna be? I wanna wear it now. Finally, I can wear it, yes. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video, especially if you wanna see more free and independent content like this. I will catch you in the next one. Ciao.